Mohammed Moin, and I'm going to tell you about uh, retinal detachment. Usually, it's the case that how do you decide which type of surgery you're going to do? Uh, you get uh, asked this thing in your exams, and especially if otherwise, even if you're a patient and you want to go in for surgery, uh, sometimes there can be a challenge on deciding which type of surgery is the best and which will give you the optimum results for your age and different stuff. So this is typically a retinal detachment, which you see over here. This is a retinal break where you're seeing. And uh, we're going to show you an algorithm based on what is the best in these cases. So let's suppose we have a case with a superior retinal break. This is a horseshoe tear in the superior temporal quadrant. And uh, if we show that this has got a retinal detachment which is a macula sparing retinal detachment how would you approach this the algorithm uh, would be let's go with the algorithm if it is a superior break and uh, if you want to approach this break you can either do a parse planar vitrectomy or you can do bars planar vitrectomy or can either be with gas or with silicon oil uh, usually, as a gas is preferred, which could be C2, uh, C2F6 or C3F8 or SF6. Well, if it's a superior break, then you would consider a buckling, which could either be done with a tire or a sponge. So how do you decide which of them can be done? Well, actually, all of them are applicable. They can all be done to do the same thing. It would all depend on uh, the experience of the surgeon and the age of the patient, the anesthetic he's going to get uh, done and what outcomes are expected from this surgery. So this is a superior break. So what is the most common in superior break is that you've got gravity, but it is pushing the fluid downward. But if you seal that break, if you do a vitrectomy which is doing a vitrectomy and you would clear this area of the vitreous and you've got the subretinal fluid over here and uh, in these patients if I draw on this if suppose you had a break over here and uh, the retinal detachment is over over here once you do the parse plan of vitrectomy then you've got the SRF surrounding area over here suppose this was the detached this was all detached area and uh, you did um, the vitrectomy, you can see the bullous RD over here, then in order to inject gas, you need to do uh, an air fluid exchange. When you would do an air fluid exchange, all the SRF would go back into this area. And if you wanted to drain out of this break, it would be difficult for you to do that. What would happen is this SRF would be going back and if it's going back nasal to the disc, you can do a retinotomy and uh, you can, if you can do a retinotomy, you can get this. If suppose this is the fluid going back all the way, you can do a retinotomy over here near the disc and drain the SRF with a flute needle which is coming over here and uh, you can get the retina flat. Or the other way is if the break is all the way up here, then if the break is all the way up here, then what you can do is, and the SRF goes all the way up here, and this is all detached, you can put perfluorocarbon, and this can go up here, and this can go up here, and then you can drain, you can do an air fluid exchange over here. This is the air bubble that comes over here. Once the air bubble is here, the SRF is all pushed upward, and you can drain from this area. So this is one way in which you want to drain the SRF and uh, get ready to either do the tamponade with gas or you can do the tamponade with uh, air or oil. But here you can see air or oil, when they go in, they are going to push that fluid or the break up. And the main reason that the retina break seals is because it's plugged. The hole is plugged. It's like putting a stopcock on uh, in, in a water tap uh, in, in a sink. And then this blockage will actually make the SRF is going to drain. 
Once you block that, no SRF is going to come into the hole, into the subretinal space, and the retina is going to go become flat. And this is typically what you would see in these cases. So this is the air, and this would make the retina flat. So where does the SRF go once you've got the air plugging the hole? Well, it is absorbed by the retinal pigment epithelium. It's got an active pump that absorbs the subretinal fluid. That is why once you do the vitrectomy, you need to drain the SRF, all of it. There might be some, some bit residual left because once you drain the SRF, you can make an adhesion between the retina and the choroid over here by putting a cryoprobe over here, which will freeze this area, and you can make a retinochoroidal adhesion over here that will make the retina uh, stay there for a long time. So that was one way of dealing with that break was you can go in and do a vitrectomy, and for that you need to do drainage of SRF, and then you need to um, do the sealing of the break, and after that you come in with air or oil. But here you can see the air and oil both are going upward. And there's the gravity tends to make the SRF go down. So as soon as the SRF is trapped behind a block a retinal break, it will get absorbed. And you need a certain time during that break to make adhesions with the choroid so that it becomes sealed and no SRF can go through that subretinal into the break into the subretinal space. And uh, if we go forward on this, suppose we have an inferior break. I'll come back to how you can do buckling for that procedure at the end of the end of the end. So I just gave the scenario that how you can deal with the superior break with retinal buckling. Now let's see if we have an inferior break. What do we have? The break is here. This patient has got a um, macula off retinal attachment and the there are two breaks. There are small holes which are in the periphery. So which of the option is going to be the best option for these? Either you can do again a parse splenar vitrectomy with a buckle or with a heavy silicone oil. Why do we need silicone oil which is heavy? We'll go into that in the next. And either you can do a buckling with either a tire or a sponge. Here we did not say air or gas so this is different for the inferior part so let's uh, or silicon oil air gas or silicon oil we didn't say that because you can see if somebody's got an inferior break he's going to gravity is going to make that water trickle down all the way to the bottom and if the water trickles down all the way at the bottom it will prevent that break from sealing so if the fluid is over here and it trickles down over here, it will continuously make this area go up. And it, once it goes up and it does not oppose to this uh, choroid over here, whatever cryo or laser you do, it's going to be a failure and the retina will remain detached. And if, as we said, if we want to go ahead and do a parse planar vitrectomy, similarly, if suppose he had the inferior break again, and this was the patient, this was the break, and this time it was inferior, and this is the SRF going all the way back, so you can either drain this by doing a retinotomy at the back, nasal to the disc, and getting that fluid out from the flute needle over here, or you can put perfluorocarbon at the back, which goes up and lifts that fluid, uh, uh, the retina subretinal fluid forward and you can drain anteriorly after doing an air fluid exchange in this limited area so the air remains over in this area and you can drain the fluid over there so that's one way of draining that inferior subretinal uh, inferior subretinal fluid now if we take if we say that we used air or oil or gas as we said we used in a superior break what would happen the air and oil would go forward. If we take this sort of a pattern at five, at five o'clock and seven o'clock, anything below this, the air and oil is not going to cover it because the temp constantly going to be high. Even if you do 100% fill, slowly it tends to, it tends to um, vacate the lower area and after just a one or two days, that area is still be vacant and 
that gives that fluid which is going to be redundant with gravity to collect on that area and to the brake to form. So if you've got an inferior brake, then you need to have that retina bone dry. You need to get all the SRF out if you're thinking of using air or gas. What you can do is ask the patient to posture uh, lying upward in that patient. But if you used heavy silicone oil in this patient, which is called Densiron, then obviously that Densiron acts or it behaves the same way as gas behaves for a superior brake because heavy silicone is oil is going to push. Uh, the brake is going to seal this and going to push the retina over here and is going to push the, the subretinal fluid upwards. And that subretinal fluid, once it gets away from the brake and get trapped over in that area, it is going to get absorbed. So that is one way of getting that uh, area done. The other way is to bring that subretinal uh, to push that sclera forward towards the brake and that releases the vitreoretinal traction. And with that, you're going to get a position of the brake with the choroid. And if you've done an expla or choroid adhesion with a cryo or a retinal laser, this is adequately going to uh, form that adhesion. So if somebody's got a superior or an inferior brake, you can either do a buckle. This is a, just showing a cross section in which you have a 360 buckle. So the buckle needs to be on the brake. And the problem, the limitation of the buckle is it can actually go to a limited amount, especially if it is a buckle, but if it is a sponge, it can go further backward. But if it's a buckle, it tends to remain either seven, maximum is eight or nine millimeters. And you need to have that break about two millimeters in front of the posterior part of the buckle. So it's going to bulge forward and it is going to make that retina stay together. Now let's see other situations in which only vitrectomy is going to be feasible. If you've got a very large giant retinal tear, especially if it goes back beyond the equator, then a buckle cannot support it. A pars plana vitrectomy is a must in these cases. Similarly, if you've got a posterior break which is behind the equator, you need to do a pars plana vitrectomy because the buckle is only going to work if the buckle is, is supports the brake or the brake comes on the buckle. If it does not come on the buckle, the retina is not going to flatten in these cases. So this is very important in these cases. And the scenario, if we go forward in the next scenario, where suppose we have another patient in which there is dialysis, the retina breaks from its adhesion at its uh, pars plana. And uh, in that case, the retina is going to be pushing backward, but it's still attached to the aura serrata so that you can do a buckle and that can resolve the dialysis in most of the cases. Now, if you had multiple inferior breaks, then a combination of buckling plus pars plana vitrectomy is going to be an ideal approach for these patients, especially if the patient has got a bullous detachment because and if a patient has got a very shallow interior de inferior detachment, then in those cases, I think a buckle would be the best approach. So if we conclude in our cases, how we're going to do, it all depends if it's a superior break or an inferior break, if either of them is a bullless detachment or, or a shallow detachment. Obviously in a shallow detachment, buckle can work very well. The good thing about buckle or a sponge is that it uh, the, you do not go inside. You prevent that formation of cataract, formation of any glaucoma, any re further retinal break formation. And uh, if there's a bullous detachment, then if you're going to do buckling, you need to drain the SRF and that the dreaded complication of subretinal hemorrhage or blood trickling to the fovea, that is a major problem which can have long-term consequences of visual recovery after this procedure. So if I were the surgeon, if I had a bullous superior detachment, I would just go for a vitrectomy if this anterior to the equator. But if it's posterior, then only vitrectomy is the case. But if it's anterior to the equator, you can either do a buckle or a vitrectomy with a bullous detachment, probably a vitrectomy would be better. But if it's a shallow detachment, multiple breaks, 
obviously you can consider a buckling either superiorly and inferiorly probably if you want to do if there's a bullish detachment then you can combine with tracheny plus buckling if there's a shallow detachment then probably inferior buckle is good enough for these cases the number of breaks if the number of breaks is much many then you need to combine either the supporting band or a buckle in cases with the pars plana vitrectomy but if you've got superior breaks and you can adequately seal those breaks either with a cryo or or a laser probably you can get away with the pars plana vitrectomy as well vitrectomy is such a beautiful surgery that you not do not get any myopia there is no mishandling of the muscles and the eye remains pristine as it is you just go in with three holes into the eye and you're out of the eye and you can restore the anatomy of the eye while buckling you do not tamper the inside of the eye but you have to go from outside but from going from outside you have a hardware which is left there and which can cause extrusion outside or inside and those are the other problems but in children i would prefer doing a buckling compared to doing a vitrectomy because in dials you don't want to end up with a cataract or glaucoma in long term so i'd prefer to do uh, and in those uh, children um, usually the detachments are not very bullous because the vitreous is uh, slightly more solid or more um, formed in them and that tends to prevent that bullous detachment from happening in those cases and history of retinal detachment is also very important and that uh, how long the detachment has been and you've got retinal cysts associated with it you've got pbr associated with it obviously if there's a pbr and if you've got uh, membranes like type c then you have to do a vitrectomy but i think vitrectomy plus a buckle is feasible in those cases because there's a shortening of the retina and by producing a buckle from the outside you can shorten that area you can cover that shortening of the retina by pushing the sclera inside and that uh, retina is covered over in that area of shortening previous glaucoma surgery i've been through those cases you if you just a very it's very challenging suppose somebody's got an amet glaucoma valve there or trabeculectomy if you're going to do that surgery then those surgeries are other surgeries are gone so vitrectomy probably remains the only choice in these patients and then if you want to do a surgery under general anesthesia then you can either do a buckling or a vitrectomy but if it's local anesthesia I think vitrectomy works very well especially under sedation and uh, if you're going to do local anesthesia then you're running problems with bradycardia per operatively patient having a lot of pain you can do it but probably tends to be very cumbersome doing in that case and then as i mentioned earlier glaucoma uh, can happen in patients with the vitrectomy if you use oil with emulsification those are the issues which you get while in buckling you can get myopia depending on the type of buckle you use if you use 360 buckling then obviously more myopia but if you use a segmental buckle you can get astigmatism if you use a sponge even then uh, probably those are uh, preferable in that case but the sponge the problem is the extrusion rate is higher in those patients so i think uh, we'll finish off with that and i hope you had a overview of how you can deal a patient with the retinal attachment there are many ways to skin the cat uh, uh, to uh, the, do the same stuff but uh, you need to have an understanding what it is and whatever case you see just decide by doing looking at different factors and then giving the right answer thank you very much for watching please subscribe to the panel uh, to the channel and uh, press the like button thank you